Well, I guess introduce yourself first because you're on the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. And welcome. My name is Rachel Tuckman, and I am a licensed mental health counselor working in the five towns. Um, I work with women and children and adults um, experiencing phase of life problems, depression, um, infertility, post hysterectomy. Um, and I am a health at every size aligned um, clinician, which means that I help parents and young adults learn the behaviors that really support their health. Um, and I use a weight neutral approach, which means we never discuss changing our bodies or weight loss in order to achieve health um, and talking about just the connection between mind and body. Um, and I'm happy to be here talking about this important topic with Lisa tonight. Thank you, Rachel. I'm Lisa Septimus. I am a teacher at North Shore Hebrew Academy High School, and I am a Yoetzet Halacha of the Five Towns, and also very excited to be here tonight presenting on this topic. And when we, we call this topic Simanavot Libanim, which is a sign the, the parental behavior is a sign towards what the kids will become. And the Torah in general places a strong emphasis on yichus. There seems to be an assumption that's often made that good breeds good and bad causes and repeats itself with bad. Uh, just two very quick examples of this, um, which you see from the Kitsu, Kitzur Shulchan Aruch, Hatzedakah Hu Siman Lezera Avraham Avinu. We have this concept that a person who is charitable, that's a sign that they come from Avraham Avinu, that they're descendant, that they're Jewish in a sense. And similarly, we have this idea that a person who is of bad character, who has bad characteristics or is uh, brazen, and uncharitable is sometimes called a ben nida. And um, the, the child of someone who, who did not observe the laws of nida when getting pregnant. And uh, I know that as a yoet said, I deal with the anxiety that this causes many women and thinking about how careful they have to be in order to sort of project forward in terms of their children and I think one of the reasons we're here tonight is because not just Torah, but society in general talks about where you come from and who your parents were seems to determine so much about our patterns, our health, our happiness, our values. And Rachel and I are here to talk about creating healthy patterns. And we're specifically interested in addressing what happens if you you're, did not have a healthy model. You don't come from a family of origin where you saw good modeling. Um, so Rachel, um, I first wanna talk about when we say good families, and sometimes there's a big emphasis in the dating world also, someone should come from a good family. We're looking to connect our child with a good family. What do, what do people mean when they say a good family? And what do you think they really should be meaning? Okay, so it's interesting. Um, I don't know what people mean when they say someone should come from a good family. It could mean so many different things. I think it depends on the community we're in. Um, I think very often when people say that, um, they're missing what's really important about potential matches, about a partner. Um, so sometimes a good family means a family that has like status. So they're well respected in the community. The father is well known. The mother is, you know, he's a learner or he's a big rabbi or she's, you know, someone who's a speaker in the community. It could be financial status that they're wealthy. Um, it could be, you know, yichus, like, you know, their connections and who they're related to. And it doesn't even really matter if they're not the greatest people, but oh, his grandfather or his uncle or whatever it is. Um, 
So I don't really know when people say like, does he come from a good family? I'm not sure. I would like to think ideally people are saying, you know, like, do they have parents that are like good people that, you know, the the family seems like normal, you know, healthy, that they're, you know, nothing too crazy going on there. We haven't seen horrible things coming out of their home. It doesn't, there's not some public, you know, who knows what that's going on that the whole community knows about. But even then I would say, it's not fair to judge, and I'm sure we're going to get into this. It's not fair to judge one person because maybe their family is messy, but they might actually be like a really fine person just because they came from something bad. And and I know we do plan to talk about it. Like our Imahot and even our Avot did not come from the finest families, and they were still like incredible, amazing people. So I think that, yes, there are some things we you know want to look for, for sure, if our children are in the dating world or even for ourselves. But again, I don't think that's the end all and be all because you can be someone who came from a really unhealthy family and that could actually propel you to be an even better person if you do the work and we'll get into this discussion, but you have the self-awareness and you have that commitment to like, I want to do better. Like I came from such hardship and I want to build a better life for myself. So I think that um, it's important to kind of have an open mind and instead of looking at someone's family, maybe looking at like who the person is right now, and maybe even their understanding of their family, you know, do they recognize where there was dysfunction? Do they have a commitment to themselves to do better for themselves? You know, do they want a different life for themselves? What are their values? Did they take on the values of their family that maybe you're not so comfortable with? Or do they have different values? And I think that's important to look at really like, the individual themselves again that awareness that commitment to work that wanting to do better and different um and again you know we people can look on the outside like this like wonderful family but you you never really know what's going on in someone's house um so i think we should really be focusing on like the individuals in front of us and and what they're telling us about themselves i love that thank you yeah you know um I, I love that you brought up the Avod and Imahot because, first of all, you know, on the one hand, we know Avraham, you know, was the child of someone who sold idols, and he somehow broke out of that pattern and becomes the father of now what we're all attributing is someone who's charitable must be a child of Avraham. So the, the patterns can can be rewritten as we see. And what's also funny um, is, you know, when Avraham looks for a match for his son, he, um, he doesn't want to look at the Kananim and he goes back to Haran where his family is from. And yet, like, and yet we see Lot and Betuel are not people that you really want to, they, they don't seem to be such great characters. And really the reason that Rivka is chosen is because she defies her family, is the ways in which she is able to rise above that, even though she's had a brother and father who are who are so different. And, and finally, something you said that I think is so important for everyone to, to think about is there really is no perfect family and you never know what's going on because even the Avot and Imahot, when, you know, when they uh, were committed to a godly way of life, there were certain patterns that they had that were challenging or problematic, like favoring one child, mm -hmm. which repeated itself in three successive generations and did, you know, did, was problematic. So I think that we, we when you look, if you look deep enough at any family, every family is going to have certain things that you want to recreate that are beautiful, that are midot and values that we can learn from. And every family is going to have certain elements that are unhealthy, that maybe need some fine tuning and some work. Um, so, even despite that, I know that when, um, when there is particular dysfunction or trauma or grief, it is, 
it is really even more uh, difficult. What are some of the, like if someone is coming from that kind of a background where they grew up or they encountered a lot of trauma, grief, poor relational patterns, you know, what are some of the things that, that they fear when they create their own family? What are some of the questions that haunt them, do you think, when they're starting out? Um, so I think it's important to acknowledge that nobody has a perfect childhood. It's like just not possible. And even us, you know, this generation now we're raising children, like we're also not providing our children with a perfect childhood. And that's not the goal. The goal is to give your children the skills and ability to cope with whatever challenges they may face, either as a result of some of our behavior, which, you know, hopefully it's not terrible, but it's just we're human and we make mistakes, or just being in this world, right? So we're supposed to be supporting our child's development. We can't guarantee its outcome. And that's important to know. Like, we're just doing our best. We're going to make mistakes. And that's okay. We hope that our relationship is strong enough, though, that we kind of have like enough in that, you know, emotional bank account with our kids that when we have some withdrawals where, you know, maybe we're not in our finest moment, we were a little bit moody, we weren't so supportive when they came home from school and with a bad grade or whatever it is, we have enough in the bank account with them so that it doesn't, you know, have that negative balance that it's like in a really bad place. So we want to create a foundation with our families, not just with our kids, by the way, with our spouses too, right? We want to have healthy relationships with the people that we love and care about. Um, and that kind of, like, I'll touch on this a little, it's so much to get into, but kind of like attachment theory, right? Attachment theory teaches us um, about the relationships between human beings. Humans are born with a need to form a bond with a caregiver, but this also happens in romantic relationships, right? So it's not just with kids and adults, but it's also mm -hmm. with spouses, partners, friends, like we all need to have, so not just romantic, but relationships in general. Um, it's about the bonds between people. And so when we're little, we need to attach in order to survive, right? And so that's what babies and and kids will do they'll find ways to seek out their caregiver and if their caregiver responds in a loving you know um, responsive way then they develop secure attachment and then if they don't respond in a loving consistent um, available way then there's all different kinds of um, attachment disorders that they can develop you can resolve attachment issues so even if you grew up with a parent or a caregiver that was not responsive and was not caring and was maybe even dangerous for you, either abusive or neglectful or whatever it was, you can process that and learn to understand it. So how you make sense of your childhood is going to have a profound effect on how you help your own children. And that's why I think it's important for us to try to look back, not in a way that we're harping on our childhood and like trying to fix it or repair it, we're, we're saying the past is the past, but we want to understand the effect that it had on us. Um, so I think that's important to understand like what your experiences were like, what were your parents' responses to you when you were sad? What were things that you knew people liked about you and your family or didn't like about you? What were the things your parents said about you maybe behind your back that they thought you didn't know that, you know, they liked about you or they didn't like about you? That all affects how you feel about yourself and how you present yourself in your relationships, how you felt about your emotions when you were sad. How were you reacted to? What was the message you got about your feelings and were you allowed to have feelings? Um, those are all important things to think about. So we want to really be asking ourselves, not so much like what what was the experience, right? Because I know lots of people that grew up in really chaotic homes and they're actually really healthy people, objectively chaotic homes. And then I know people that grew up in like, oh, my parents were so like healthy and normal and nice and functional, but like, I don't know, I have these massive issues. So it's not really a matter of like, how bad was it on a, you know, were you abused? Were you, you know, homeless? Was your dad an alcoholic? But it's, how did it affect you? 
you know? Yeah. So were you able to express your emotions without being called dramatic or stop crying or knock it off? Did you feel like you had to always make peace in the house and make sure everybody was happy? Were things swept under the rug in your family or did you talk about them? Did you feel like there were boundaries in your family that you always had to talk about things when you were sad, you came in and you were forced to talk about it? Or there was kind of a respect for, you know what, you're having a hard time. Like, I'll give you space, but I'm here for you and I want to talk to you. Again, no perfect childhood, but just examining, like, how did the patterns in my home affect how I feel about myself? And I think that's very important because a child's security of attachment to their parents is very strongly related to their parents' understanding of their early life experiences. So if I can understand how the responses that I got as a child, as a teen, even in my, my early marriage, if I can understand how that's affecting me, then I can show up better for my child. Right. So I think that's really important. You know, um, it, it's, it's interesting. A, a surprising um, example of what you're talking about. Um, so it, it sounds like I'm starting a joke, but this is actually the truth. I am, you know, married to a rabbi and we happen to live next door to a pastor, um, uh, an African-American pastor who um, we happen to follow each other on Instagram. He'll like sometimes listen to my Torah videos. I'll listen to his stuff. And he wrote a book and I read it this past Shabbos. It's called uh, The Day My Daddy Died. And um, and and talks about like some of the dysfunction in his childhood and basically his father was an absent father and how like you know sometimes we have a, a coping mechanism when we don't have as you were saying about attachment a secure attachment that initially serves us well because it allows us to succeed and to get through by in the world and he became very successful, actually, and he was, um, you know, uh, making good living and raising a family, and 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 very and and very proud. And at some point, he had he had to sort of face the fact that um, he was emotionally absent, mm -hmm. and there were reasons why he was emotionally absent, and many of them had to do with shutting out maybe his family of origin, and also this idea that everything, the way I give love, the way I can be useful is just providing, 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 and it all became about things. Yeah. Um, so it's not, you know, it's just one example, but sometimes you look back because you cannot, you can't fix until you really are able to see what you're repeating and what you're doing, what you're doing wrong. So it, it, that, that's kind of a, a first step. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm curious if you ever do this with couples. Um, I had also read that one, one step in moving beyond your dysfunctional pattern is, is just having intention to move beyond that dysfunctional pattern and setting certain, uh, you know, aspirations. So uh, I don't know if you, uh, your thoughts about that and yeah. how important intention is. Yeah. So, so like I said earlier, we can't change what happened to us as children, but we can change the way that we think about those events. And so being aware of our present experiences and our emotions and our perceptions and trying to make sense of that and how it impacts our life, that's important. And so how we do that then is through practices of mindfulness, right? Being aware of our thoughts and feelings. What's going on for me when my child is throwing a full-blown tantrum? Kids are supposed to throw tantrums. Why am I getting so dysregulated from her screaming? Why do I feel like I can't cope and I wanna scream at her? Be quiet, or I wanna shake her, or I wanna, and we have all these like scary thoughts sometimes or things that we're ashamed to admit we feel. Sometimes we feel like we wanna run away from our families. Why do I feel like this? Where is this coming from? And so if we're able to just like stop for a minute and kind of like 
listen to our bodies. Where am I feeling this right now? Right? Where is this? What is this tension I'm feeling in my chest? What, like, what's the story that I'm telling myself that I feel this? Um, I think that that's really the first step, you know, again, kind of being curious, not why am I like this? Like, I'm insane. What's wrong with me? But what's happening for me right now? Why do I feel this way? Right? Not judgmental, but compassionate and curious. And I think that's really important. And then kind of committing to this idea of lifelong learning, right? Like I want to just kind of be open to growing and challenging myself and learning for, you know, from my kids um, and understanding that working, that every kind of challenge with my child is a learning opportunity. It helps me discover something about myself. It helps me to refine my character. It helps me to get curious about my kids, to be close to them. Um, and I think that's, that's important. I think also just being flexible also with how we think about things, right? Instead of those knee jerk reactions of like, my kid is screaming and crying, so I'm going to scream back at them. Okay, deep breath. Like, my child is having a really hard time right now. Let me focus on what's going on inside of them that's leading to their behavior. Let me, I'm going to stop thinking about how it's impacting me, how it's making me mad, and how I'm embarrassed. Or how, and I'm going to say, my child is having a really hard time right now. What does he or she need in this moment? We want our kids to be able to like look in and reflect, but if we always make their behavior about how they're making us mad, how they're embarrassing us, how they're stressing us, how they're whatever, then they never learn to become emotionally um, aware and, it, and they never learn to reflect on their own feelings. They never learn that regulation. They never learn that emotional vocabulary. So mm -hmm. we wanna be curious about what's leading to their behavior rather than how it makes us feel. And I think that's a really important piece. You know, when our kids are doing things that are triggering us and setting us off, saying, okay, right now in this moment, I need to just think about why my child might be feeling the way they are. And I'm gonna put aside my feelings in this moment because my job is to show up for my child. So we wanna stop linking their behavior to our feelings. That's big, that's very hard. Um, we want to help our kids reflect on what's going on inside for them. And we want to celebrate the things about them that are different from us, right? And that helps a child, by the way, have a sense of self based on what's inside of them. So, you know, if you have a child who, if your whole family loves, you know, basketball and you have a child that loves soccer, instead of being like, oh, you know, you're the only one, right? Instead of you're different from us, like, I love that you are like choosing your own thing to like be interested in and love like we all love basketball but like you decided you love soccer and that's so awesome right instead of seeing it as a threat my child is trying to be different or withdrawing or why do they like that or i don't like that they like that seeing it as like this child is trying to come into their own they're being themselves they're learning autonomy they have the the comfort and emotional safety to be who they want to be this is actually something that's really big i i often tell clients just to reframe, like when your child is screaming and crying and it's setting you off so much, if you know that emotion in your home was not something that was supported and it wasn't, there wasn't a safe space for it, for you to be able to say, as, as, as annoying as it might be in that moment that your child is screaming, to say, they feel safe to fully express themselves right now in front of me. So it's my job to continue holding that safe space for them, even though it's so hard for me to just let them cry and be emotional. And even thinking to yourself, I wasn't given this space. So it's hard for me right now to, to be with the discomfort of their emotions. But the fact that they're showing the emotion so freely means that clearly we're in a home where, where emotion is allowed and it's, it's a good thing. Um, and so even just reframing it from like, my child is trying to drive me nuts to my child feels that this is a safe place, a safe place to express themselves that can help us feel less attacked, less attacked, less defensive, and a little bit more compassionate for our children. So again, just kind of like thinking, separating yourself from the behavior and also seeing those typical behaviors that kids express as, you know, healthy things and that you're creating a home where like they feel okay to do those things. And again, it doesn't mean that you allow tantrums and that you're cool with it, but it means that when you accept the behavior, then you're more able to tend to it and then get down on your kid's level and say, hey, you're having a really hard time because your brother stole that toy from you or you're, or we took away the iPad and we told you now it's time to get ready for, for a bath and you're so upset. 
when you're able to connect with them on that level, okay, then we can bring down that that dysregulation. We give them that emotional vocabulary. And we know that people that have more words for emotions, that have better emotional vocabularies, have better emotion coping skills. So again, just kind of detaching your personal story from what's happening and allowing yourself to give yourself a little bit of a pat on the back and view that negative behavior as there's this healthy expression of emotion going on. And right now, how I respond to it is going to affect what happens in the bigger picture. Right. Wow. Um, yeah, look, I, I think it's, it is so challenging having have, I think any parent has been down this road. And sometimes it's so easy to also feel like, we, we don't want to lose control or we need to discipline. Right. And um, it sometimes is, it, it's kind of a, it seems to me that there's a little bit of irony that sometimes to make space for our children's emotional development and to distinguish and to allow and to still maintain, let's say, discipline um, and structure for kids, but to also give them room to, for their emotions, you have to kind of pull back your own emotions. Yeah. Not, that, not that you don't allow for a connection with a child, but you have to, when they're expressing it, you have to like put yours on pause as an adult. This is not, you know, that moment for you to emotionally react. You have to lower the intensity and allow, you know, make space for theirs. Or, um, I mean, or just hold space for both, meaning, you know, even let's say in a relationship with a partner, you know, if they bring up a difficult subject, you can notice I'm feeling really defensive right now. You know, he's bringing up that whatever it is from the other day. I'm feeling really defensive, but I know that this conversation is really important for us to connect and to repair. And so I can, acknowledge that I'm feeling defensive. And I can even tell my partner, I'm noticing I'm feeling really defensive, but this conversation feels really important to me. So I'm going to try to communicate, you know, where I'm feeling in my body or just in my mind, you know, whatever's coming up for me. But I know that this conversation is good for us. So you can hold space for both, you know, so when your child is doing whatever it is that's setting you off, and depending on their age, by the way, if it's a teenager, and they roll their eyes at you and like that's a huge trigger for you i would in that moment i wouldn't say anything but maybe later on after you resolve whatever the issue is with your teen you can say you know when you when you roll your eyes it, it's really hard for me to you know have a conversation with you it makes me feel like you're not listening or you're being disrespectful and and you know i don't want to react but i'm just telling you it's something to be conscious of like trying not to roll your eyes or whatever, you can have that conversation with them and let them know how that affects you. Um, obviously, they're not responsible for it, but teaching them like, hey, your behavior does impact me sometimes. Um, so I think there's space for both. It doesn't have to be like, don't deal with your emotions. I think notice them, yes, but also understanding like, but my child's not responsible for how I feel in this moment. I'm responsible for it. My partner's not even responsible for how I feel in this moment necessarily. I'm responsible for it. Um, and I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes, like one thing you mentioned that resonated is you can always discuss things later. It's not, you know, sometimes it's better. So the person doesn't feel like you are just turning it into your issue now. And, yes. and, that, and that's a big spousal, <laughs> I think, situation. Right? Yes, it's like, yes. Um, Better, like sometimes you want everyone wants to get in their own side but you're getting in your side is also kind of shutting out the other person sometimes if it's while they're trying to express themselves sometimes it, there is you have to both have space for it but it sometimes is hard at the same time one thing i i wanted to to say when you were when you were talking about noticing how your body reacts, noticing um, like when your child or your spouse is expressing an emotion, you know how difficult it is for you. I wanted to um, I wanted to bring up that it is it is difficult to change a pattern. Yes. 
and it is really it is really really admirable you know right here on our source sheet like kind of the one highlighted in the middle there is um amar rabbi abahu makom shabale tshuva omdim tzadikim gmurim enam omdim at a place where a baal tshuva the the merit of a baal tshuva is so much greater than the merit of a completely righteous person. And I think that is because taking what, you know, getting beyond just being on autopilot and what we've grown up with and the patterns we're used to and saying, you know what, I'm going to intentionally, I recognize what that was and who I was, and I'm choosing to respond somewhat differently. I'm choosing something different for my own life. Take yeah. tremendous strength and takes work because um, those things can be ingrained. And, and it's also, um, you know, one other, I started off by saying that the Torah talks about um, how certain midot are so ingrained, but it also, it does, suggest like this source about the Baal Tshuva and in other places that capacity for change and and the and the idea that you never really are evaluated until you show who you who you are it is so easy to get sucked into the pattern but you are judged for yourself um you know uh when we talk about the yud gimel midot rachamim 13 attributes of Hashem, it, Hashem is no chesed lalafim, gives um, kindness to the thousand, thousands of generations, thousands of generations, and he forgives, um, but he also puts sin on the to the fourth and fifth generation, so, or, or punishment. And, and Rashi says on that, that Hashem only gives punishment to the next generation if you show yourself to do the same thing, if you carry over that pattern. But if you break out of that pattern, then that isn't true. Then that is not how God responds. And we all have the power to do so. Um, you know, um, Edith Eager talks a lot about this in her books, which I've yes. been obsessed with. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of what we were talking about, resolving the past and strengthening ourselves to, to kind of move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so besides recognizing, is there any other, um, any other, any other way to like move forward on another path, especially like, what if you kind of start out like, what if there's someone listening now who feels like, oh, I'm already repeating that negative pattern? Yeah. Is there any hope? Like, what can they do? Yes. So, so there's always hope. I always say it is never too late to make a change. Even if your children are adults now, by the way, it is never too late to make a repair and take responsibility and, and fix the relationship. So I think that's very important to know. Um, I think there a deep appreciation of and, and a respect for the protective responses that you had as like a child which is again that's that's so much of what our responses are now they're these responses that we learned when we were younger and we carry them into adulthood so if we can start looking at those and saying okay i actually needed those to survive in in my house because when i'm a child i don't have the autonomy that I have as an adult. So I have to learn, if my parents don't always respond to my needs, I have to learn to not have so many needs. I have to learn to be really independent. And by the way, you hear people like that all the time that they're like, no, like I'm, I'm fine. Like I don't need anyone to do it for me. I figure it out, I've got it. Not to say that that's necessarily a bad skill, but sometimes that comes, that's a learned response from, no one's gonna show up for me, so I have to do it myself. But that can get in the way of a healthy relationship when you're always, figuring it out yourself. You're not sharing your feelings. You're not processing stuff. So I think to start, we have to have a deep appreciation, not saying what's wrong with me. I'm so messed up. I am so reactive. I'm crazy. I get that this is what I had to do in the house that I lived in because it just made sense. 
I, I, you know, I had to have no, low needs. I had to be the fixer. I had to be the one that cleaned up all the messes. I had to be, you know, the, whatever it was, I had to be the perfect child because my parents were dealing with a lot with my brother and I didn't want them to be upset. Or I had to be the mommy because there was, my mother was sick or my father was depressed or, you know, so we have to show ourselves that, that we can tolerate the distress of not using those same tools anymore right so i don't have to behave that way and i can be okay with that so even just again having respect for it and saying thank you so much little you know little rachel for doing that but you don't have to do that anymore i think that's a big piece and then i think something that's important to know um i actually heard this from she's a therapist she has an instagram page it's very popular her name is nedra glover tawab and she actually had this video the other day that I thought was so powerful. And she said that a lot of parents parent from a space of what they needed as a child. So she said, if you needed more financial stability, like you might be someone who like really works hard to make sure you have a good job and you have a good money and your kids never feel like, you know, they say, oh, can I get that new crazy sweatshirt? And you're like, yeah, of course. So yeah, you know, like, and the minute they want something, there doesn't have to be a special occasion. You're just buying it because as a child, you heard we can't afford it, or you knew you couldn't afford it, or, you know, or you give tons of affection because your parents didn't give affection. And she was saying, we can't use a one size fits all approach with people. We have to elevate our parenting skills when we see what our kids uniquely need, and it might not be what we needed, you know? So just because you grew up in a house where maybe money was tight, don't assume that your children need a house where money is flowing and you go on fancy vacations like that. That's what they need. That's what maybe you needed, but it's not what they need. And so we have to ask our kids. We have to watch them, observe them. We have to listen when they tell us what they need. Um, you know, we can't say to our kids like I'm giving you what's important. You're so ungrateful. Right. Our kids are different than us. They don't necessarily want the same things. We're giving ourselves what's important with the vacation or the, you know, or buying the sweatshirts or, you know, the name brands or whatever it is that we're doing or the fancy this or the fan. We have to ask our kids, like, what do you need? So I thought that was so important. Like, make sure that you're parenting from a space of what they need, not what you need, you know? Um, I, something just occurred to me also as you're talking Yeah. that, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but this is sort of something that um, like was implied in some of Edith Eager's uh, writings. Yeah. That your parent, like some parents don't always do that. They don't ask what this individual needs. They give what they think. Yes. But that we have to kind of at some point as a, a come to terms with that and that our parents at least as the child in us, that our parents did the best that they could with what they knew. They weren't necessarily coming to the Nishmat conference <laughs> and hearing about listening for not repeating a pattern or that you or that you, you know, can't assume what your child's needs are. And that even if our parents maybe didn't give us what we need, they tried. They may have had good intentions and maybe it's time to part of our moving forward is coming to terms with that. Yeah. And well, that's what I said when we started is like, there's no such thing as a perfect childhood. Like your parents can't, even the most loving, healthy, even the parents that come to the Nishmat conference, even the therapist parent, we can't always meet our children's needs because we have jobs because, you know, and I, I actually have a client who, um, you know, when she was younger, her, her mother's mother passed away and her mother was grieving and she was going through something hard with her friends and her mother couldn't show up for her. That's a valid reason for her mm -hmm. not to be emotionally available as parents. We can't always meet their needs. And that's why I say like, we need to forgive ourselves a little bit. And that's why I'm saying, put those deposits into the emotional bank account, because there will be times that we can't show up, that we don't show up right, that, you know, it's just, we can't give them what they need. We can't, we cannot fix everything for them. They're going to have struggles and difficulties. And I often say to my kids, I joke, but I'm serious. Like, what are you going to tell your therapist about me? Because I know that I can't give them everything. And it's okay if they have things to talk about with their therapist about me. I expect that fully. 
but I hope it's just enough that we still have a healthy relationship and they have a safe space to process maybe the areas where I wasn't so strong for them or that they feel, you know, that I should have done better. Like they're allowed to have those feelings. And just like we're allowed to feel like, you know what, I know my parents loved me and cared about me, but I really needed X, Y, Z, or yeah, they weren't perfect or they had a lot going on in their lives. I think that's important. And so we have to have compassion for ourselves. And even, I don't know if I want to say compassion because for some people it's hard if you had difficult parents and maybe you have a complicated relationship with them. I don't know if you have to have compassion, but just understanding that this is what they did. They had these tools. Maybe they should have gained more tools, but for whatever reason they didn't. And you can actually give yourself what you need now. You don't need your parents to do it for you. You can kind of reparent yourself and say, hey, Rachel, what do you need right now? You're getting really bent out of shape, or you're really scared, or you're really upset, or you're really defensive. What do you need right now? And then you can give it to yourself. You know, if you have a partner, a healthy, supportive partner, you can talk about it with them. If you have a therapist, talk about it with them. But again, understanding like, yeah, we're going to make mistakes. That's okay. That's not the goal. The goal is not to be a perfect parent. It's to be a good enough parent, you know? Okay. Um, I, I, if anyone, I know we're, we're kind of going to be wrapping up. If anyone has any questions or anything in the chat before we do, um, we will try to pay attention to that. Um, and, and I think, you know, just to sort of like repeat some of the pearls we heard, because sometimes you hear a lot of different things in a talk, but I think that we spoke about how there is a pull of repeating patterns. It is, it is tough. We fall, we learn, we have these attachment theories. We learn certain styles of emoting or certain disp like secure attachments or avoidance attachments or various types from our childhood. But ultimately, we have the ability, and the Torah speaks to this as well, to create, to resolve our issues and to, to move forward in a different way. And I think, Rachel, you, you kind of laid out for us part of how that's done through first looking back and, and kind of seeing what we went through and identifying it. And then also looking at the present and seeing how it's impacting some of our reactions and our relationships, whether it's as a parent, a spouse, or probably even in friendships also. Um, mm -hmm. And then kind of being conscious to, to um, you know, resolve some of those those issues um, and, and and respond to the people's needs right in front of us, not respond, you know, um, sometimes just just uh, in our own way. Yeah, uh, I missed something there. You can fill in, but I saw someone. I don't know if anyone did ask something or maybe we're OK. <laughs> To, I mean, if anyone has questions, yeah, type, definitely type them in. But um, yeah, just to elaborate on that, like our parents are our mirrors, you know, and we're our mirrors to our own children. So how we react to our kids or how we were reacted to shows us who we are. So if we're crying and someone's like, oh, you're so annoying, you are so dramatic, you overreact to everything. Then we grow up thinking that we're dramatic, we overreact. People don't like us. People don't, no one's going to be there for us. Like that's how we believe, you know, and then we're attracted to people who allow us to continue relating to ourselves in that same way, right? We end up with partners that do that. Um, it, it becomes like this activation of our attachment system and I, and our body and our brains like what's familiar. We always go to those things because we think that that's, even if it's not what's good for us, we always kind of go for the same thing. So if you have that belief, like my wants and my needs are too much, then we might end up with a partner who continues that system. And it doesn't mean, by the way, if you have a partner who's like that, like, shoot, forget it, it's over, get divorced. But it means, yeah, we have work to do. You know, I notice that, you know, when I get upset that I feel like, you know, he, he my partner can't respond to me. He runs away. It's because I'm too much. But maybe it's because your partner grew up in a house where emotions were not talked about and they were completely shut down. So if you're highly emotional, that's a trigger for your partner. Like, I can't deal with this. And it's not because you're too much, but it's because 
he learned or she, whoever it is, learned emotions are bad and we don't deal with them, you know? And so that's where there has to be a talk about like, what was it like for you growing up? Like, did your parents acknowledge when you were going through that hard time? What was it like when, you know, your dad died or when your sister was sick or we have to like talk about these things. Um, and that's how we do the work. You're not doomed. You just got to do the work. There is, there is a question in the chat, yes. yeah. which is, you know, what happens if your parents um, who may have unhealthy ways of parenting are still involved in your chill in raising your own children um so i i i'm i'm not i'm gonna i'm not the expert i'll tell you my thought quickly and then we'll go to the expert rachel here but um i would imagine setting you're gonna talk talk to us about setting boundaries yep. clearly yeah but but i would also uh would you would you also say though that even if a kid sees grandparents that um may sometimes say the wrong thing that uh, if if they have a secure attachment and a good relationship with the parent is that protective or not definitely i would say for sure boundaries are important meaning if your parents maybe are saying things to your kids that you don't that you're not comfortable with that you don't like that go against your values whatever it is then you should definitely set a boundary with your parents of like you know mom and dad thank you so much i know you care so much about the kids like we got this you know like or oh actually we're actually trying to stay away from saying those kinds of things because of x y and z it doesn't have to be confrontation confrontation means i'm going to be yelling and fighting it's just stating a boundary we love so much when you're with the kids we're actually trying not to talk about that stuff because of x y and z thank you so much for understanding and then yeah what you can do is even speak to your own children about it you know and say um, if they're older, you know, you could say, oh, I know like, you know, Bubby or grandma, you know, says this to you sometimes. It's just the way that they think when I was growing up, they used to do that. I want you to know that that's not how we feel. And of course, if I hear it, I'm going to say something, but just know that, you know, and then you state the value of your, that your family has and, and you reinforce, we love Bubby. We love grandma. She's so great. But you know what? Sometimes people get stuck in their ways of thinking and it's hard for them to get out of it. So if you hear that, just know you can come and tell me and, and that's not how we approach things or whatever it is. Or here's what you can say if you feel you know, upset or whatever it is, giving them the tools so that they know that you have their back, that, you know, grandma and grandpa are opinionated or say things or whatever, and that they can kind of just like respectfully never say like, oh, mom said to just brush off whatever you say, but kind of in their head to know like, all right, this is, you know, she has her opinions, but that's not how my family works. You know, I think that's important. Um, empowering them and also again being firm with the boundaries like grandparents don't they don't get to raise their grandkids they just don't so you have to state the boundary of like mom dad like we got this like thank you so much like i know you care and you're concerned and we're so grateful for that we're gonna take care of this you don't have to worry you just get all the easy stuff mom you know you get all the nachas and we'll do the hard stuff right uh, and, and i and i suspect that sometimes Th that boundary has to be put down even firmer with certain very pushy, it, you know, certain parents won't get it that easily. And, and it may take, it, it might be a little harder. Someone asked another question, which is how about dealing with spouses behaviors that they may have learned from their parents that they don't realize are unhealthy or what you want the kids to learn. So again, I'm going to throw it back to the expert, but I'll, I guess I'll, you know, my, my, my one thing I was thinking about during this presentation also with spouses though, is how important it is to um, discuss your, your values and your goals yeah. um, for your children. Yeah. And sometimes, um, sometimes you really will find sometimes you're not on the same page and then you need to negotiate that sometimes you're on the same page with what you value but your approach of how to get there or your ideas of how to get there may be a little bit different and um maybe 
you know, I think if, and I'll, we'll hear from Rachel now, but like, I, I imagine that when it's, when things are, when you, you know, lead with what you each see, the, 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 po the ways that you each parent positively and make a positive impact, but also can, you know, discuss what makes, you know, whether this, I, whether this approach is working or good or blah, 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 maybe you can negotiate that together. Yeah, I think, I think communication is really important. And I think um, sometimes we have very strong opinions about like things that we don't want our kids to do or like that parent or, you know, that we don't like a certain way that our spouse parents. Um, but I think that we have to understand that it's supposed to be collaborative and that each parent is allowed to bring their flavor into parenting and that we have to respect that. And we have to find a way to kind of just... Um, allow each one to express themselves in the way that they need. So your way might not be the only way, you know? So uh, sometimes I hear, it, this is a common thing that I hear is like one parent is very playful, but at the wrong times, like don't hype the kids up before bedtime. And, you know, like it's, don't do that and this and that. And it's kind of like, can we like find the middle ground where your spouse doesn't feel like you're bossing them around and essentially telling them you're a bad parent because you don't know what our kids need. You just play with them. And like, you're not thinking, and I'm the one that knows now is calm time. And now is this and that. It feels very condescending and it feels you're kind of pushing that parent out of you know, their role as a partner in raising the children. So I think there needs to be a communication, not in front of the kids separately of like, I love how playful you are with the kids. It's so good for them. And I see they love it so much. I get worried that like they get hyped up before bedtime and then let your spouse talk about it with you. You know, maybe they don't get hyped up. Maybe it's helping drain their energy, but like you're being uptight about it or you're being controlling about it, but you guys need to have a discussion um, and there needs to be room for both of you to parent in the way that feels good for you. Um, but I think, again, there needs to be a discussion and, and and an acceptance that my spouse is not going to parent exactly the way that I want them to. We're not always going to be on the same page, but we always need to be talking about it um, and discussing it and being open to hearing each other's views. I'm not talking with you so I can prove how you were wrong before. I'm talking with you so I can understand, like, what were you... What were you thinking when you were doing that? Like, where are you coming from? Why is that your approach with them? You know, and then maybe through that understanding, maybe I'll see that what you're doing is not so unhealthy. Maybe it actually makes sense. Or maybe I'll still disagree, but I can I can be a little bit more flexible. And I think that's really important. Beautiful. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, okay. Awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's it's always a pleasure to talk and learn from Rachel, and it, it's hard on this um, online to always feel the presence of everyone. But thank you guys for being here, and for those who ask questions, especially, and for Tamar for handling the tech. End. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Great night. Good night.